Blog Talk Radio. for joining us today on the Earthwork Project from Woman Song. I am your hostess, Jolivette Williams, and today we're going to sort through the process of beekeeping, a very fundamental and uh, simple journey through beekeeping and the uh, process of becoming a bee guardian. Now is the time to prepare to become a bee guardian in time for spring. Most people don't know that you can keep a hive or two in most backyards, but you can. And backyard beekeeping supports abundant native and medicinal plant populations, provides nutritious and medicinal honey, provides pollination for food, fruit trees, berries, uh, and creates deep contentment in a healing partnership with nature. Today our topics will include the bees, a history of honeybees and their relationship with humans, uh, beginning beekeeping, setting up, obtaining hives. Uh, In particular, we're going to focus on the top bar hive and contrast it with other hiving methods. That happens to be the method that I am going to employ uh, in the spring. And we're going to talk about some of the other hive options as well that may work better for you. Uh, we're going to talk about bee problems very briefly, some of the diseases and pests and disorders that are associated with the bee colony and why, where they stem from, and what we can do to be uh, helpful for the bees and offer solutions. We're going to talk about the swarm, swarm dynamics, catching swarms, the exploration of the um, different methods that have been used in antiquity. We're going to talk about beekeeping from a holistic approach, biodynamic standards and organic standards. And, of course, we must have a special focus on the woman as we honor the womb. For women interested in learning to keep bees, this episode will go beyond uh, conventional and natural beekeeping practices to explore and integrate the ancient spiritual connection between women honeybees, and the divine feminine, incorporating sacred practices that allow a deep communion with the hive and with your own inner queen. We'll be right back.
welcome back, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. This is the first of the uh, weekly broadcast that we will have every Wednesday afternoon during the lunch hour to talk about self-sustainability, homesteading, and topics of interest uh, for those who are returning to a more self-sufficient way of living. So welcome back to you all, and thank you for being with us. We're going to get right into the topics um, this particular week because we have so much, and this is such a diverse and weighty topic that many of the resources that I use uh, for this particular presentation, I am adding it to the wall of the community page that can be found at facebook.com forward slash the earth works uh, because I cannot for sake of time get heavily into these topics but they are very important and issues that I think that that we do need to speak on just as a primer and hopefully to entice those who might otherwise see beekeeping as something that is too far beyond our reach. So we're going to start with the bees and the history of the bees. And this is what I've found in my research about ancient records that some of you may find interesting. Here's a quote. It says, when the sun weeps a second time and lets all waters from his eyes, it is changed into working bees. They work in the flowers of each kind, and honey and wax are produced instead of water. That's found in Psalm 825, first millennium BCE. Now, it is thought that the first official mention recognizing the importance of honey dates from the first dynasty when the title of sealer of the honey is given. The oldest pictures of beekeepers in action are from the Old Kingdom in Nyerser's Sun Temple beekeepers. And they are shown blowing smoke into the hives and they are removing the honeycomb. Very similar to uh, the smoking method that is used today. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later uh, in this presentation. But after extracting the honey from the cones, it's strained and poured into earthen jars which were then sealed. And honey, treated in this manner, could be kept for years. Honey is the only food that does not spoil. I don't know if you're aware of this, but honey has been found in the tombs of Egyptian pharaohs. And it has been tasted by archaeologists. That is a job that I wouldn't want to have. And they found it to be edible. edible. The honey cannot be stored, of course, at extremely hot temperatures because it will start the process of fermentation because of the the sugars present. Uh, But in ancient Egypt, they paid uh, taxes with honey. So it was a form of of currency. Uh, After his death, Alexander the Great's remains were preserved in a huge crock of honey. And it is often used as an ingredient in uh, antifreeze mixtures. I did not know that. I thought that was just a little bit tidbit of information. But anyway, from the New Kingdom, the mentions of honey become more frequent, but only four depictions of honey production and no actual hives have been found to date. As far as harvesting, little is known about how the honey was harvested at that time, but according to uh, the tomb depictions, the hives were opened from the back and smoke was blown into the hive and the bees escaped through the hive entrance to the front. And anything else about the process in antiquity is uh, conjecture based on how honey has been traditionally harvested in Egypt. Now the interesting thing is I recently heard a lecture where uh, the lecturer was saying that honey was not food to the ancient African. It's very interesting to me how often these types of proclamations are made about what you know what is food, what was food, what was not, and the dress and this and, and that. I did hear a lecture talking about that, and that honey was only used for medicinal purposes to dress wounds and for you know topical applications and to treat illnesses. But upon researching the topic, this is what I found. I found that honey was used for sweetening as sugar was actually unknown, the type of sugar that, you know, that processed 
sugar that we have today was unknown in the antiquities. It was part of the diet of the well-to-do, one of one's necessities, and I put that in quotes because I'm using the words of a courtier in a knee. Here's what he said. This is a quote. He said, I was supplied from the table of the king with bread of oblation for the king, beer likewise, meat. Now, I've also heard that ancient Africans didn't eat meat, but that's for a different show. Fat meat, vegetables, various fruit, honey, cakes, wine, oil. My necessities were apportioned in life and health, as his majesty himself said, for love of me. This is from the tomb of Inanni, the reign of Thutmose II. So the idea that honey was never eaten is just not true. It's just not true. And that it was only used for medicinal purposes. In addition, there are documentaries and various documented pictures of indigenous people on the continent breaking into the sides of trees and mounds and various containments and taking out honey. We see it being done. So the idea, and they use smoke, actually, uh, to do that, to smoke bees and take some of the honey out. So we do see this being done, so I'm not certain where the idea that honey is not food, I'm not sure where that comes from, but from this uh, research that I have been able to ascertain as of yet, I am not convinced. That, that is the case. Okay, so that is just a brief look at the history, and we're going to move on to the setting up process. When you talk about becoming a beekeeper and what it's going to take for you to invest, not just money, but time uh, and energy, we have to look at obtaining the hive, the types of hives, actual bees, and the queens. Starting an apiary is relatively easy. However, there are some things that you need to consider. There are pros and cons as with anything, and there are many reasons why you would want to raise honeybees. Honey is probably the most obvious answer. Who wouldn't love to have their own fresh batches of honey? A single honeybee can produce one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in her lifetime, and that's about six weeks. And with a colony consisting of thousands of bees, we know that that can add up very quickly. Wax, in addition, is another byproduct of the beekeeping process. Bees convert their food and make it into the wax comb. And wax is used in many ways, including candles and cosmetics. Many creams, lipsticks, and lip balms contain beeswax. You can even learn how to make your own and other personal care products made from your very own wax. And the importance of the quality of that wax is completely under your control. If you are interested in a more organic and healthful method of producing wax, then you have full control of that by having your own hive. Pollination is another pro, a key component Uh, because it is the the key purpose of the bee life. If you want healthy plants, bees help with that. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, bee pollination is responsible for $15 billion in added crop value, particularly for specialty crops such as almonds and other nuts, berries, fruits, and vegetables. About one mouthful in three in the diet directly or indirectly benefits from honeybee pollination. So it's very important. Considering the bee itself, they are very diligent workers, and there's a reason why we say busy as a bee. Bees are constant workers. The nice thing is that it doesn't take a lot of work on your part to raise the bees. Essentially, you give them a place, make sure that they have the components that they need to produce, and they do all the work. You now have a labor force that will produce the honey and the wax for you. The bees are independent, so there's not a lot of time commitment on your part. You plan for about half an hour each week and for honey collecting only twice a year. That's done in the early part of the growing season and then right before fall because you want to make sure that you leave, you know, that you're collecting when you should be so that you leave enough for the bees for over winter so that your bees will be happy and the relationship uh, between you and the bees are good. Now let's look at some of the cons uh, when you're talking about you know the initial setup. 
There are some downsides to raising honeybees. The one that comes to my mind first would be stings. Uh, they can be a major deterrent uh, for anyone who, you know, would be a beekeeper. You have to check with your doctor to make sure first that you are not one of the unlucky people who are allergic to bee stings. And even if you are not allergic, stings can still be slightly painful. Uh, luckily, though, most beekeepers over time develop an immunity to the sting. Then you have to look at the cost of supplies. Now, the initial cost is relatively inexpensive in contrast when you're looking at setting up other producing animals when you're talking about husbandry it's very inexpensive but just looking at beekeeping by itself you will need to invest in supplies uh, such as a hive proper clothing a smoker uh, if you choose to use a smoker extracting equipment and hive supplies and as of this broadcast, and it could change, you know, as quickly as spring, uh, because, you know, the supply and demand becomes greater uh, as it becomes later in the season. And so you may be able to purchase a queen now for $125 Well, as it gets into the season. And closer to spring, you could pay as much as $300. But the um, for right now, a single new hive could cost about $125. Clothing and gear, about $200. And a package of new bees can run between $100 $150. And often you can find starter kits with the bees, boxes, and the gear for a combined price for about $400. The first year can be pretty tough. On top of learning the ins and outs of beekeeping, you generally won't get a large amount of honey because you're just allowing the bees to establish themselves, and you're just learning the ins and outs. For the first year, you have to understand that you may not harvest a bit, and you could actually lose your bees. Most first-year beekeepers are advised to get two hives, specifically for that purpose, because you may lose a hive. And to kind of keep everything going and, and so that you're not, you don't lose motivation, Generally, you're told to just go ahead and get two hives just to, you know, to be safe. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to do one hive and, and cross my fingers and hope that it works. But anyway, as far as the community, be sure to talk to your local beekeepers and beekeeping organizations. And it's always a good idea to go to any experts in your area and see if you can go amongst their bees just to get a feel and to be more comfortable with the bees. What I did this fall, I put out a bee feeder and was able to spend time with the bees around my home. And so I was able to become a little bit more comfortable. They would actually land on me and I wouldn't, you know, lose my mind and scream or what have you. I was actually able to keep a cool head and they at one point were feeding directly from my hand. So I was able to do that, but if you are unable to do that, it is a good idea to start to acclimate yourselves to the bees because they do feed on your energy just like any other animal does. Uh, there are plenty of organizations about beekeeping available uh, if you're just willing to take a little time and look for it, and these organizations are particularly useful for finding swarms uh, once you are established with your apiary. Now, I had to contact my local city officials to find out if I was able to keep a hive because I live in the city, and I was. I was able to, to I can uh, keep a hive, but you do know that there are so many ordinances and various rules in these different cities and communities, so you have to find out first if you are able to keep bees in your area. Uh, especially you have to be mindful if you have a lot of children in your neighborhood. You may not want to do two hives. Um, you need to consider the, the trees and other flowering plants in your area where your bees will actually go to get food to bring back to make your honey. We're going to talk about that in a minute as well when we talk about the big uproar with the disappearing hive syndrome, which is actually just the killing off of the bees. We're going to talk about that. But anyway, you want to consider 
all of those things when you're thinking about initially setting up an APRE for, uh, you know, a backyard beekeeping situation. Now, obtaining a hive, if you want to pay, you know, $125, $150 or not, one of the things that I thought I was being so different and I said, you know, I'm I'm not going to go out and pay when I can get a hive right in my area. And as it turns out, most first-year beekeepers do capture feral swarms. Uh, You can check with your local beekeepers in your area, and in my case, my local beekeeper told me that uh, he would be expanding this spring and he wouldn't be able to offer bee packages uh, to me. Well, fine. I researched further and I found that, you know, many first-year beekeepers just go ahead and catch a swarm in their area. When the, um, when the season turns and the hives are growing and they break off and, and fly off, and when you see that big grouping of bees that are on the branches or trapped in buildings or where, 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 what have you, those are swarms that have broken off from the original community, and you can capture those. And ta-da, you are now a beekeeper. There is a swarm near me because I have been feeding them, as I said before, and bees will fly up to three miles for food and water. Yes, bees need water. That is something to consider when you are planning, you know, the setup of your apiary. They do need a water source. So I know that there are is at least one swarm that is within three miles of my home. Now, I must admit that I set up a bee feeder uh, with ulterior motives. I wanted to supplement the hive uh, that was near me so that they would have an easier time over winter and hopefully they would make it so that I could claim them as my own in the spring. When I first learned about um, beekeeping and that kind of thing, I thought, well, you know what, the first thing that I need to do is I need to make sure that these bees have enough food so that hopefully I can acquire them. So there are many different methods of luring uh, a feral swarm. I'm going to use a natural method requiring herbal extracts. I added lemongrass to the feeder and they were mad about it. They loved it to death. So they were initially lured to my backyard when I was saging very heavily at the end of the summer season. Later, I learned that bees love sage. So my strategy for this spring will be to replicate the conditions that I accidentally created this past fall. I will burn organic sage and put out a feeder with the lemongrass added, and I will load the feeder into the top bar hive and hope that they find the accommodations acceptable. We're going to take a quick break because we're halfway through this broadcast. When we come back, I want to talk about, you hear me mentioning the, the top bar hive. I want to talk about the different Hives. You have the Langsworth Hive, the Top Bar Hive, also known as the Kenyan Hive, and the characteristics of the Wear Hive. Um, those are the three most often used uh, hives, and we're going to talk about those. And we're also going to talk about why I chose to use the Top Bar method. And we're going to get further into this discussion and try to squeeze everything in before our time is out. I appreciate everybody coming in. Thank you for being with us, those in the chat room and our callers. If you're interested in being a part of the discussion, please give us a call at 310-634-1953. And we'll be back in just a moment. us to take this journey together. Thank you for joining us every Sunday night at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. And especially for the ladies, there's a private Facebook group 
where you can speak freely and express the songs of your heart about issues specific to the African American woman. Please follow us on Twitter at Woman Song and check out our YouTube channel for upcoming guests and highlights of our shows. We look forward to many more opportunities to rebuild, restore, and renew with the Woman Song Community Experience on blogtalkradio.com. As a strong woman, you will do the thing that many things cannot be done. When we speak of nation building, restructure, and advancement of our community, a society cannot succeed unless it can support itself and supply its own basic human needs. Let's learn those basic skills and crafts together. Advance the movement by listening in to our weekly podcast, where we will share books, featured speakers, instructional videos, and other relevant information on our community page, found at facebook.com forward slash The Earth Works as we rediscover and remember how the earth works. See you there. Thank you for being with us this afternoon, and welcome back to the broadcast. We left off talking about, or about to get into, the different types of hives. I often speak about the top bar hive because that is the one that I am going to use, but I want to tell you about the different types of hives. Now, there are any number of hives, but there are some that are much more specific and and, um, popular. When you think about beekeeping and you think about a hive, a beehive, the one that comes to mind immediately, that's the Langsroth hive. It's this box where the, the top is taken off and the frames are pulled out. You pop them into the extractor, spin it, get the honey, pop it back in, put the top back on, and you're good to go. That particular hive, while it is most popular, it is also very stressing for the bees because essentially that is their home and you are ripping the top off of it, which changes the temperature because the inner part of the hive is kept at a constant temperature and when you remove that, you disrupt the temperature, you disrupt the hive and it can become very very stressful. So you have to keep that in mind that this particular hive was created for maximum honey production. This particular hive is already, the the, uh, frames are those rectangular pieces that you see pulled out, have honey, have uh, honey placed in the little wax combs that are pre-made. They come with the frame. Oftentimes the wax is filled with pesticides, which we're going to get into how the bees get into all of these pesticides and translate it into their wax and also into their honey. We have these issues, and as with any producing animal, when you stress the animal, they are more susceptible to disease. They aren't as strong, and they aren't able to be as resilient. Now, the top bar hive, also known as the Kenyan hive, this is a more quote-unquote natural approach to keeping bees. Uh, And it has pros and cons, too. And I want to give the pros and cons for this particular hive because even though I am um, 
you know, leaning toward using this method, I want you to be able to make a decision that uh, works for you. It is low cost. It's ergonomic. It's a simpler system. It gives you a, a better opportunity to observe the bees because the side of the top bar hive actually, there's actually a window where you don't have to rip the top off of the hive to see the bees, to keep an eye on them, uh, to make sure that they're, they're active, they're moving, that the queen is producing. Uh, these are some of the things that you will be doing within that 30 minutes of time invested that we spoke about earlier in the broadcast. It's simply looking just to make sure that everything is okay. Um, so with this particular hive, you're able to do that much more, much less intrusive. It produces a wild honeycomb because the top bar is uh, laying atop the housing and then the bees attach with their propolis the comb foundation and then they build down the wax so that they can put in their, you know, their, set up their brood chambers where they put the um, babies and then also where they start to store pollen and then they store nectar, which is then uh, dried and uh, turns into the honey. One of the cons that is always discussed with when you're talking about a top bar hive that anyone who has a problem with the top bar hive generally will bring up is the fact that you get less honey. With the other hive containers or types of hives, it's already set up where the bees do not have to, to draw out wax or comb for the for the you know the honey. It's already prepared for them and all they have to do is fill it. Okay. But with the top bar method they actually have to do it. They have to do it themselves the way that they have to do in nature. And they have to build the whole thing. For some, that is a con because if you're going to go into beekeeping for the purposes of selling your honey, you need larger amounts. And you're not going to get that kind of uh, production from a top bar hive. You're going to get that from the Langsroth hive, type hive, the traditional type of hive. You're going to get more honey that way. But keeping in mind that we're talking more so about bee guardianship. And so here again, when we're talking about the stressors, we're talking about constantly harvesting large amounts of honey, causing the bees, forcing them to have to go out and replace that. Because keep in mind that the honey is essentially the bees' stores for winter. They collect nectar and pollen all summer so that in winter, when there is none, they use that for food. So you have to keep that in mind when we're talking about bee guardianship. We're not only raising bees for our exclusive benefit. We're also raising them, raising the bees for the benefit of the earth and so that they can do their job in the most natural way and so that it would be uh, less taxing on them. That's really the only con for the top bar hive is that you get less honey. It was developed as a low-cost hive for Africa. Uh, it does not need a foundation. The bees build a comb so that it hangs down from the top of the bar, and it expands horizontally, not vertically. And it is advocated as a more natural way of beekeeping. And the hive itself doesn't have a foundation compared to uh, the Langsroth. And after each harvest, the bee has to rebuild the cones. And more beeswax uh, is actually harvested with the top bar hives because each time that you harvest the honey, you get the comb as well. So if you're going to be interested in utilizing the wax as well, you will definitely get a tremendous amount of wax with this particular uh, method. Now, there is the, the wear hive, which is far less used. Uh, it's a simple hive box with no frames. And essentially what it is, just to make it simple, it's the top bar hive. And instead of it going vertically, it's horizontal. It's basically a top bar hive that is set up on its, you know, on its ends. And the bees build down uh, into the comb, and then you affix the... Um, you know, the uh, top bars to each uh, box. Now, what I found interesting about this particular hive is it has a quilt section. It's called a quilt 
uh, area that provides a layer of insulation for the hive. In there, you put wood shavings and that kind of thing, and it sits just under the roof of the uppermost boxes. In it, of course, the bees build a natural comb in the first top box, uh, and then it extends down into the newer boxes, and newer boxes are added to the bottom as the comb gets longer and longer and longer. And the boxes of honey are harvested from the top. So it's an interesting method as well. I have not learned a whole lot about it, but it looks like it gives you some of the benefits of the top bar hive, but the main function of the top bar hive that I particularly liked was the, the uh, window feature that you can actually observe your hive without disturbing it. I don't want to have to go into the hive and, you know, destroy the, um, the seal because the, the, on the top, the bee seal closed, the, you know, the top of the house with propolis. And so each time you open it up to look in, you rip it and you tear it open, and then they have to produce propolis again to reseal that, to keep out uh, dust and wind and mites and various other uh, intruders that might try to get into the hive. They seal that up, and so each time that's more work that you know happens uh, for the bee. But anyway, with this particular hive option, to me, you don't have the um, wonderful side window feature so that you can observe without disturbing the bees whatsoever. I really, really like that. And and so that is, I'm still sold. Even after researching the different uh, types of uh, hive boxes, I am still sold with the uh, top bar system. Now, we're going to go into the breakdown of the social system of the bees the queens in particular, they are very social, and you can't expect a queen to produce a whole colony by herself. Therefore, it's important to know the basics of bee society. There are three levels in the bee community, the worker bee, the drone, and the queen. Worker bees are all females. They're responsible for a variety of activities, such as tending the queen, building comb, guarding the hive's entrance, and collecting food. Drones are males. And their sole responsibility, you guessed it, is to mate with the queen. All right. Wait a minute. Did you just say all right? Huh? Huh? Oh, no, I was, um... The queen is responsible for all the genetic traits within the colony. So now when you're looking at finding a, you know, a colony or hive in the wild, which is something that we are going to do... The clusters of bees that you see in the wild are called swarms. Now, often these bees will divide their colonies because they are either very healthy and producing very quickly, or they can also split because a queen was injured or sick. So sometimes those swarms are actually without a queen. Collecting a swarm is not very difficult, as those bees tend to be very mild-mannered, But regardless, always be sure when you are collecting a swarm, wear the proper clothing. Bees on tree limbs can be collected by cutting the limb uh, and placing or shaking the limb inside of a container. Bees on a flat surface can be just scraped into a cardboard box. But generally, they are collected by just putting them into a box and smoke is sprayed behind them to encourage them to go towards the container. Some of the commercial beekeepers will say that sometimes free isn't always better because wild bees can carry disease or have weak genetic material. Yeah, they sell bees, so, you know, you can just take that information for what it, you know, what it's worth. I happen to think that if there's a wild swarm in my area, it's there because it is acclimated to the uh, area. It was able to make it, you know, through winter, and it is properly adapted. And so I think that it is most beneficial as opposed to sending out side of my area for a swarm to, if I am able, capture one in my area, preferably near my home. So that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to locate uh, wild bees. Another um, method that I I just want to add this, I found on a a bee forum, a guy said that what he does every year is he puts an ad in Craigslist and says that he's a swarm remover. 
And so when bees swarm, people, of course, are, you know, they're shocked by the, you know, the sheer size of the ball or the, you know, oh, my God, there are a billion bees. And, you know, you have flashbacks of the bee movie from the 70s. They call him and say, oh, my God, come get this. And he says, oh, I'll do it for free, you know. And he comes over with a cardboard box, and now he has a new swarm. So I thought, what a great idea. You know, I'm probably not going to do that, but that's a great idea. And it's a great way to get local bees free as opposed to, you know, spending 150 bucks for them. And just because, this is another thing, just because you see the bees doesn't mean that you can take them. In some states, uh, they, they have laws about what is considered property. So if a tree limb is on your neighbor's property, taking the bees could actually constitute stealing. So check local ordinances before attempting to capture bees and understand what it is that you can do and, you know, which way to approach that in your area. Most beekeepers argue against buying bees because they actually believe, and, and I agree, that wild bees are better suited because of the natural diseases in many areas, they were actually able to overcome that, as I was mentioning earlier. However, for the beginning beekeeper, they will suggest for a first year a beekeeper to go ahead and buy your bees because it's easier and it's safer if you don't know what you're doing. Here again, I stand behind. Uh, if you are able to take the time and just read a little bit, you'll find that uh, capturing a swarm is relatively simple. Make sure that you take all of the necessary precautions. The last area that we're going to talk about before we have to get out of here is problems and solutions. Some of the problems and solutions with bees, maintaining a healthy hive. Many of us accept the responsibility of beekeeping because we enjoy the goodness of pure honey, the increased pollination of the gardens. However, we must balance our needs with those of the bees maintaining a healthy hive and um, understand that that requires careful observation and monitoring. That I cannot stress is the most major part of your work because you're only going to harvest honey twice a year. Everything else that goes into maintaining a healthy hive is really about you being observant and on top of disturbances and uh, differences in, in the hive. And to do that, you have to spend time and learn what is normal for your bees. Be sure that the bees have sufficient resources. Many areas of the country have what's called uh, nectar dearths, and during these times, it's important that you feed your bees. If they don't have sufficient honey, meaning you've over-harvested, which generally is not a problem at all with a top bar hive, uh, but if you've over-harvested, then it is your responsibility to feed the bees so that they can make it over winter. In addition to needing to be fed, they also will need pollen. So make sure that you have uh, well-mated, vigorous queens. Uh, research shows that better-mated queens, and the more productive they are, the more productive your colony will be, and the less diseases you'll have. I assume that comes from the fact that bees live about six weeks, so if your queen is very vigorous and uh, fertile and she's always keeping the brood chamber full, you always have new, young, live, fresh, wonderful bees to do their job. So. Uh, you want to make sure that there's a lot of activity and vigorous uh, reproduction happening in your hive so that it will remain healthy. And uh, you must make sure that you choose any treatments carefully to not jeopardize the quality of the honey. When the bees are stressed from over-harvesting, they're more susceptible to disease. Understand that honey is the food that the bees store for themselves. So when we harvest the honey, we're raiding their stash and we're stressing the colony. We're, we're causing them to have to reproduce uh, more than they normally would were we not harvesting, you know, their food. So this is where good bee guardianship becomes the most important component to sustainable, earth-friendly bee management. The bees will work to replace the stores that you removed, and it's our responsibility to make sure that proper uh, and sufficient materials are there to replace what we've harvested from them. Some of the issues are various mites that uh, actually latch on and eat the blood of the bees. There's a hive beetle 
that will just take up residence at the hive itself and lay her babies in, and, and destroy the honey. You have tracheal mites that will migrate into the body of the bee and restrict their oxygen so that they can't breathe. They actually feed on the trachea uh, of the bee. You have wax moths that do uh, something very similar to the uh, beetles. They will come in and lay their egg. They destroy the comb and even the uh, wooden hive itself. So these are things that we have to take into consideration, but I wanted to spend a little bit more time on this nosema. Uh, this is a fungus. Many uh, of our scholars believe that this is actually uh, what cancer is. A cancer is a fungus. And when you read about this particular condition with the bees and this fungus that takes over the body, uh, it's actually something that is present in the gut of the bee. And if the bee is overstressed, the colony is overworked, then that fungus proliferates and takes over the bee and wipes it out. And to me, that was very analogous to our bodies and how we have certain bacteria, good and bad, that are, you know, that take residence in our gut. And you always want the good bacteria to outnumber the bad. When I read that, I thought that was very interesting. Dr. Marcola says that bee colonies around the globe are mysteriously disappearing. Now, I know all of you have heard about this mysterious phenomena known as the colony collapse disorder. Yes, they've given it a name. It's a disorder. CCD. Since 06, uh, it's estimated that close to a third of all honeybee colonies have simply vanished into thin air. They just disappear. Right. So where are the bees going? Well, one forerunning theory is that genetic engineering of crops is involved, either through the genetically modified crops themselves or the pesticides and herbicides that go with them. I lean more toward uh, the pesticides and herbicides that go with that because wonderful companies like Monsanto, the world leader in this type of biotechnology, actually, you know, graft in into the DNA of seed pesticides. So if the plant is going to grow its own pesticide, then it would stand to reason that the pollen, the nectar produced by those flowering plants, will have pesticides in them. In addition to that, these plants are cross-pollinated. So that means that if a bee visits a plant that already has insecticides in the nectar and pollen, and it goes and lands on another plant, a nearby plant, that is not contaminated, it is now cross-contaminated. So we see there is some suspected evidence that toxicity is transmitted into the pollen of the plants, and the pollen is not limited to just that plant but other nearby plants that further spread these uh, poisons to the pollinating insects and then ultimately to their nest. I don't think that this is a phenomena or so difficult to understand at all. Now, the next question I would raise is, is this transmitted toxin lethal to the honeybees and other insects, and is it being transmitted into the honey? I leave you to ponder that uh, for yourself. I have my own answer, uh, and those who know me well probably already know what I think. There was, however, I want to read this really quickly, in 2007, an article called uh, A Meta-Analysis of Effects on BT Crops on Honeybees. And this is just a quick excerpt. It says, honeybees are the most important pollinators of any agricultural crop worldwide and are a key test species used in the tiered safety assessment of genetically engineered insect resistant crops. There is concern that widespread planting of these transgenetic crops could harm bee populations. So I read that because if the bee is a test species, meaning they look at how the bee is affected and then we know other things will be affected as well, then we see that the bee is dying. It is diseased and it is, it is disappearing. So, you know, do the math. And the company that, um, what I thought was interesting too, is the company that dedicated itself to finding evidence about the CCD uh, was later bought out by Monsanto. How interesting is that? 
If that's not the, the fox guarding the hen house, then I don't know what is. But all right, so lastly, if you're interested in, in uh, being a part of this conversation, feel free to give us a call. The number is 310-634-1953. This is the last little segment. And I had to throw this in about the Africanized honeybee. One of the things that came up, each case that I would speak with someone about starting a beekeeping, a backyard hive, they would say, what about the, the Africanized bee? What, you have to be safe. What if the Africanized bee comes in and, you know, and, and then it kills you? Well, actually, the Africanized bee, let me give you a quick, brief history on that, what happened with that. The Africanized bee was actually taken uh, to South America and crossbred with the, with the South American bee. Now, keep in mind, before I, I carry you through this process, An Africanized bee is a bee from Africa. Okay, there's been a connotation. You know, it's Africanized. Oh, my God. It's You know, and it's going to kill you because everything from the continent is bad and negative and black and dark and bad luck and horrible. And so it's an Africanized bee, and it kills people. It stings you for no reason. Oh, my God. Well, let's talk about that. They actually took the bee from Africa, took it to South America, and crossbred it with the South American bee so that they could make a stronger bee. Well, what happened was these bees crossed. So basically you have a modification, a a GMO, a genetically modified organism, okay, two species that came together that otherwise were separate. And what you got was an aggressive bee. This bee was released, finger quotes, by accident into South America and began its its migration northward. The, The... Africanized bee is already in the southern United States, has been for many years, okay? So the likelihood is great that you already live near Africanized bees, and most beekeepers, bees have been, have crossed uh, as far as the um, a European uh, honeybee, which is the standard honeybee that you come to know in this area, that's the European Nized uh, honeybee and the Africanized honeybee cross. It's actually an Africanized honeybee cross with a South American uh, honeybee. W- that's already happened. Okay. Now, while those bees are more aggressive, they are generally it's certain situations where that bee is a danger. They are very protective of their honey stores, and so I don't want to diminish the importance of knowing. If you have um, had your uh, Europeanized honey uh, bee queen replaced by an Africanized bee, but you got to understand that here's what the hoopla is about: the Africanized honey bee is extremely, extremely hostile toward the European bee. Okay, let me say that again. What the Africanized bee will do is it will the queen will go into an established Europeanized honeybee colony and will replace that queen. She's very hostile. These kinds of concepts are hard sometimes for us to accept, but the truth is is that the reason that the, the Africanized honeybee, I believe, is so demonized is simply because she is a little bit more protective, in some cases a lot bit, and she is aggressive to the Europeanized bee. So understand that when you're collecting uh, or trying to catch a, a feral swarm, particular, particularly in the southern United States, it's very likely that you're going to be dealing with Africanized bees. It is very likely. So please keep that in mind and understand that you have to be careful. But one of the, the things that I like to think about is that uh, in Africa, and as we talked about at the top of the broadcast, honey was being harvested. Okay, So it's not impossible. It just may be that we have to, our, our approach may have to be a little bit different. But there's no reason to become so alarmed because the mix, and the, the uh, migration has already happened. For the most part, it was relatively uneventful. We don't hear stories every other day 
about the Africanized bee in the southern United States attacking and killing babies. Believe me, if it happened one time, we'd hear it, you know, every day for a week. So just keep that in mind and don't, you know, don't get sucked up in in the um, sensationalism and the hype. Do your homework, learn about uh, beekeeping, and the best way to overcome fear is to focus on your objective and prepare for obstacles because that's what I'm doing and I hope that you will join me too. Thanks for being with us this afternoon as we rediscover and remember how the earth works. Have a great afternoon.